Test, test. I can hear you, Andy. Yep. Thanks. <laughs> I was just wondering if any else good. <laughs> <laughs> Sound good. Uh, I don't see Vince on. It's, I guess I'll start because we're five minutes late and I'm sure Vince will pop on when he can. So welcome everybody. I'm Heather Sloop. I'm the vice chair. Vince was just on our pre-meeting, so hopefully he can connect soon. Um, Let's go ahead and work on the meeting minutes from last week or last month. And uh, does anybody have any questions about those minutes? All right, hearing no questions. Uh, can I get, does anybody? This meeting is being does anybody uh, have any objections? So, to hi, guys. Oh, you're back. Yeah. We're just yeah. doing, needing it, a minute. I don't know what was. It kicked me out for a couple of different times. I don't know what happened. And then it switched me back to joining with, from my browser. And I'm going, okay. All right. So, so does anybody um, have any objections to approving the, or to approving the meeting minutes? Okay, with no objections, the meeting minutes are approved. Vince, you can take it over from here. We're on uh, CDOT update. Oh, we're, that's quick, good. <clears throat> okay, CDOT update. Um, one of the first things that happened, this is a little unusual meeting this uh, time, um, is they had an hour workshop on Wednesday, in which they discussed the budget. Um, and it uh, was pretty thorough. In fact, we're going to have a discussion of the budget uh, later on in our meeting. And so uh, save your questions. And uh, 
when they come up, uh, please voice them. Um, one of the things that they did do is um, did a bus tour of I-25 North and went through a lot of different things up there. And I don't have any uh, information about that because I wasn't able to go. Uh, then they went on to the regular meeting and um, they only had, um, I think, uh, two motions and they dealt with um, a content agenda and a budget supplement. And that was about it. Questions? So we, Vince, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce anybody. So we need to go back and do that. I apologize. I was really trying to rock and roll, but thanks. You were, you were, uh, did you do that already? Okay, I'm Vince Rogalski and I'm chairman of the stack. I'm also chairman of the Gun and Bell Transportation Planning Region. Since I can't see everybody, um, uh, let's see, where's my list? Okay, um, Dr. Cog. Good morning, Nicholas Williams, Dr. Cog region. Ron Pepsdorf, Dr. Cog staff. Take me a little while to get my notes out here. The Central Front Range. Dick Elsner, Central Front Range. Dwayne McFall, Central Front uh, Range. Eastern, okay, Eastern TPR. Uh, Chris Richardson, Eastern TPR. Grand Valley. Oh, sorry, Vince, you kind of were muffled. Uh, Dana Brosta, Grand Valley MCO. Rachel Peterson, Grand Valley MPO. Okay, and I, and I said, I'm Vince Rogowski, Chairman of the Gunnison Valley Planning Region. Um, Roger, are you there? Okay, moving on. Inner Mountain. Hi, I'm Terry Parch. I'm the City Engineer for City of Glenwood Springs and also the Co-Chair of the Inner Mountain Transportation Planning Region. Okay, my understanding too is uh, he has resigned. Uh, yes, um, yes, our last chair resigned. So um, we have a new chair and uh, a new co-chair. Okay, great. Welcome. Thank you. Um, North Front Range, excuse me, North Front Range. Kristen Stevens, North Front Range MPO. I think Becky Carrasco is here too. Yes, uh, and Suzette as well. Yeah. Oh, yep. and Suzette. Good morning. Morning. Northwest. Hi, Heather Sloop, Northwest TPR. Pikes Peak. Morning, Vince. Morning, everybody. Uh, John Lusados, uh, Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments uh, staff. Um, Commissioner Williams, who is our normal representative, uh, texted me this morning and will not be able to attend. So, unless there's somebody else from Pikes Peak uh, on the line higher in the uh, uh, succession order. I'm going to pull an Al Hag and say I'm in charge. <laughs> okay. Uh, Pueblo area. Uh, Chris Wiseman's on the Zoom as well as Eva Cosleon. Okay. Louise Valley. Hi, Keith Baker here, and Vern Hirsink is on the line, and so is Julie Constant, our transportation director from Durango Region 5. Good morning, Jennifer Oliver, South Central TPR. Southeast. Good morning, Ron Cook. Okay, Southwest. Good morning, everybody. Jim Candelaria, Southwest TPR. Okay, upper front range. 
Good morning, everybody. Elizabeth Ralford, Upper Front Range. Uh, Commissioner James will be joining us late this morning. Okay, great. Um, Southern Ute in try. Ute Mountain Indian Tribe. John Cater. Kristen Kenyon. Okay. Any next? Okay, so now we're moving along. Um, you know, I just called everybody. I might as well call everybody again in terms of the TPR reports. Um, Dr. Cog. Thank you, Mr. Oh, Chair. Me. Oh. Um, I, I jumped ahead. See um, uh, update. Uh, we have her stocking here, and also we're going to realign the agenda and bring Andy uh, Christian forward to talk also um, for the legislative report. Yeah. Um, first, I just want to say hello to everybody. Uh, good to see you all virtually. Uh, I have to give compliments to. John Leosados, that's probably the first Al Haig reference anyone, any one of us have heard in probably a decade, so brilliant move there. <laughs> um, I, but on a lighter note or on a more somber note, I do want to turn it over to Andy. Uh, we all lost a, a, a friend and a statesman this uh, last week, and we wanted to have Andy on just to talk for a minute or two, if we could, about uh, uh, about uh, Hugh McKean. So, Andy. Thank you, Herman. And it, it's it's sad to come talk to you all about Hugh today. You know he passed away. He was he was a good friend to CDOT. He was one of those guys who, you know, my first time I met him in 2017 when he came down to the legislature, he came out and, you know, we were just talking and, and uh, introduced himself, uh, spoke about, I believe it was his brother-in-law who lived up in Montana and how he had the ability to go up and and hunting fish with his brother-in-law who worked for, I think, an outdoor magazine and was, a, you know, had, had wonderful access to guides and, and whatnot. So he just, his first impression to me was this man who was just filled with life and, and, and happiness. And he, he was a, you know, he was a good guy. Um, for CDOT, he was a, a good friend on his first year in 2017, though. He introduced a bill that we didn't really like. It was a bill that would have dedicated hundreds of millions of dollars to I-25 in lieu of, you know, other 10-year uh, plan projects. Um, and he also was jiggering around with our HOV policy at the time. And so HPTE and CDOT at the time, you know, did have to come out and oppose and kill his first bill. And after that, for some reason, he didn't come back and do any other funding bills for transportation. I, I, I'm not sure why. But he did continue to work with the department on many highway safety issues. And that was a common theme for the rest of his career under the dome. He worked with us on, uh, as well as state patrol on, on funding issues. He did a, a motorcycle safety reporting uh, bill for, with us. Most of these bills that he ran for traffic safety were all bipartisan and had bipartisan support. Um, he worked on continuing enforcement dollars, DUI uh, impairment uh, enforcement dollars for CDOT. He worked on just last year, he passed a bill that um, asked CDOT to take a look at studying the uh, impairment measures involved with roadside testing on cannabis impairment. And, and trying to quantify and use best practices and good science around how we do impairment, uh, you know, driving impairment tests here in Colorado and continuing to be the leading voice in that. And so, you know, he was a strong advocate for highway safety. He worked closely with CDOT's <laughs> highway safety office. Um, 
And, you know, with all of that, he's, as I said, a, a wonderful man who will be, who will be sorely missed. That's all. Thanks, Herman. Yep. Thanks. Uh, Chair, it's up to you whether you'd like Andy to just go ahead and give his legislative update now. Uh, Jamie doesn't have a federal update. Andy, I don't know if you're ready for it, but that would save you from popping back on in uh, 45 minutes or whatever. That, that sounds like a great idea. Go ahead, Andy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So very short legislative update. Not much has changed in the last month. The election is, you know, looming, and that has kind of put a pause on a variety of different policy and uh, different conversations in regards to finding sponsors. All of the conversations we had last week or last month uh, continue on. We will be, you know, moving forward with some of the bills that uh, we discussed before. The CDOT agenda, as of now, continues to be taking a look at those EV charging opportunities along the public right-of-ways. Uh, voting membership or voting for uh, transit membership in the rural TPRs, uh, and also working on some efficiencies for funding along our bridge transport, uh, bridge and tunnel enterprise, as well as um, some unsolicited proposal uh, policy for uh, laying down fiber in a CDOT right away. Um, we're also having conversations around the chain law and what we can do to possibly increase um, some uh, fines uh, for out-of-state motor or out-of-state commercial CMVs uh, for chain law violations and to see how that, um, how we can take a look at chain law this year. So those are some of the CDOT conversations. There's gonna be other, obviously, conversations with CDOT um, involved with highway safety, some of what we talked about before with impairment dollars, um, but overall, this year doesn't seem to be like it's going to be a big year for transportation where a major policy um, you know, initiative will be coming with the focus around transportation. So that's it for the legislative update, but just a, a personal update. Some of you may know that this is probably my last stack. No, not probably. It is my last stack meeting, and I'll be moving on um, for a new opportunity and uh, leaving CDOT to become the new general manager for the new Front Range Passenger Rail uh, District here along the Front Range. So my last day will be next week. And I just want to say, you know, I remember coming and speaking to the stack for the first time after working at CCI and seeing a lot of the local government folks that I had worked with there um, and, and speaking to you all at the old uh, office building over on Colorado Boulevard for the first time. So you know, it comes full circle now, and it's been a pleasure and an honor to work with all of you, and I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you. We'll miss you very much, Andy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Vince, I'll, just, to, just to close out this segment, I'll say I'm going to miss Andy, too. He's been fantastic. I think he's, I think he's our longest-serving liaison in about 25 mm -hmm. years, uh, so, so that leaves a bit of a hole for us. And if any of you know of, of anyone, we've already posted the position and it's open until we get it filled. So uh, direct, uh, direct the announcement. I'll, I'll maybe put it in the chat. And if you all can think of anybody that'd be good, please, please send it around. Thanks. All right, thanks, Andy. Is um, John Cater here? Hey, Vance, this is Bill Haas. Can you okay, hear me? Bill. Yeah, yes. John is actually, um, he's on travel this week. He's actually down in Region 5. He uh, he attended the uh, the Tribal Summit meeting, I believe, yesterday down in Durango. So um, I've just got one thing I wanted to bring up. And um, I think we have the, uh, um, the executive or the uh, director of the Colorado LTAP Center on the call today, Heather Carlson, but wanted to just give a brief kind of summary of the Colorado um, LTAP Center um, or local uh, technical assistance uh, program. And um, so the Colorado LTAP Center has been around, all these LTAP centers have been around for a number of years. I think we just reached the 40th anniversary. And this is a program that FHWA and CDOT has supported financially over the years. 
uh, and we continue to do so. And uh, the LTEP Center is really critical to helping local agencies um, with training, um, as well as technical assistance and uh, lending out uh, equipment and, um, you know, just uh, dissemination of, of information through uh, newsletter and other other uh, opportunities. So um, wanted to at least make everybody aware of the LTAP Center and all the things that it can offer and it continues to grow and look into do, new opportunities, primarily uh, um, looking at um, a new approach to offering technical assistance. Um, and hopefully uh, Heather will be able to come to a future stack meeting and maybe give a little presentation for everyone. Um, if you're interested in more information, uh, the LTEP Center has a website and you can either just search on Colorado LTAP or the um, web address is coloradoltap.org and uh, you can sign up for their newsletter and, and other things. So just wanted to to get that out there in case folks weren't aware that this this center is uh, around. That's all I have. Hey, Bill, I'm here. Hey, thanks. thanks so much, too. Just oh, worry. Heather, why don't you introduce yeah. yourself real quick then? <laughs> yeah, well, I think you said most of it um, from the two-minute elevator speech I've been able to boil it down to, but I serve as the director for Colorado LTAP, which, as Bill mentioned, is a federal grant funded by um, FHWA and then matched by CDOT and Front Range Community College currently has the contract to administer the grant. And um, we focus on bringing training, innovation, best practices, information, and new technologies to all of Colorado's local agencies with regards to public works, road and bridge and streets um, topics. So uh, just a little insight, this year we'll have over 70 days of training with over a thousand different participants in our trainings. We do everything from entry level all the way up through uh, management courses. And then we also have equipment, an equipment loan program that we um, have that we loan out so that agencies don't have to spend their money to buy certain equipment. And then also really focus on, and as Bill mentioned, going into innovation, technical assistance, and that sort of thing is where we're, we're focused on going forward. So um, I put the, the website in the chat but um, I will step out of the agenda and uh, let you guys carry on. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Now we're moving on to the um, PPR representative reports. Uh, Dr. Cog. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dr. Cog board did not meet in October. Uh, but Dr. Cog staff is currently working with uh, partners to update the uh, regional transportation demand management plan. Uh, this is opportunity, of course, to set our TDM strategies in the context of uh, a lot of bus rapid transit development that's happening in the region, uh, as well as some new state requirements for TDM for new and uh, reconfigured interchanges. Uh, Dr. Cog also is updating uh, its Regional Transportation Operations and Technology Plan, which identifies opportunities and strategies for coordinated and effective management of the region's transportation operation system. That's it for me. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, Central Front Range. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Dick Elsner. Um, Dwayne's on the call too, so if he wants to add anything after I'm done, I hope he does. Um, we had our step meeting or our, our meeting a couple of weeks ago. We approved some additions to uh, the step. We had some additional money, uh, so that that was encouraging. Uh, as far as the work going on now, if it's if it's not done, it's going to be really slow. It's getting cold. The chain up station is getting closer uh, every week. I drive past it, so we're going to have a chain up station on the north side of Kenosha and hopefully it will be used by a lot of trucks that seem to have trouble with Kenosha. I was encouraged to hear that we're trying to figure out how to increase fines on truckers that uh, don't chain up when they go because uh, on 285 as you know Vince being narrow one truck can shut everything down totally and completely. Um, I sat in on a, a preliminary design for the uh, 
area through Bailey on 285. I was very impressed with how it is uh, proceeding. I think there's going to be great community support for us. And hopefully by the end of next summer, we'll have something there that will protect people. We did have another truck uh, tip over in uh, downtown Bailey again at the bottom of the hill. It was a truck carrying asphalt. Uh, fortunately, nobody was seriously injured and it didn't do a lot of damage to anything except it was a poor attempt to uh, repave the road through Bailey. Anyway, that's all I have. If uh, Dwayne has anything. Yeah, just real quick, Dwayne McFall, um, Fremont County Commissioner. Um, the, the project on 115 near Fort Carson is still going. Um, looks like they've got the bridge where they're they're replacing a bridge. They're doing a lot of work on that bridge, and then they're going to widen some of the road. And so that project's coming along. I think it's going to kind of slow down a little bit as well because of the cold. But um, other than that, everything seems to be going pretty good right now. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Eastern TPR. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Vince. As Chris Richardson, we haven't met since the last stack meeting. Our next meeting will be in December, so nothing to report at this time. Just getting ready for winter. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, and now all right, so we don't have a, a big update either. We didn't have a board meeting since the last stack, but we do have one next Monday. And we'll be adopting um, performance measures one, two, and three um, by supporting the state um, performance measure goals. And then we'll also be up adopting the update to our public transportation public transportation agency safety plan, the PTAS, which we have to do every year. Uh, we're in the middle of our call for projects for the MMOS and CRP funding. And then we're also wrapping up our safe routes to school incentive program that was part of the CDOT uh, non-infrastructure grant that we received. And so I'll put our website in the um, chat, but it looks great. And if you're, it's kind of open source, not open source, but our app, you know, could be used maybe for other agencies if they're interested or looking at it. So a link to that is also on our website. So I'll just stick that in the chat and people can check out what we're doing. Thank you, Ben. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Gunnison Valley, I'll report on Gunnison Valley. Uh, we did not also have a TPR meeting uh, last month and so we haven't scheduled another one but it'll probably be in January sometime. Um, you know everybody's wrapping up their construction and and trying to keep everything going. Um, snow well there's a little snow this morning couldn't be much more than a half an inch and it's quit now and it's 33 degrees here. One of the things I did get an email this morning from the uh, construction people at the uh, U.S. Little Blue Creek Canyon, and they have closed down completely. There's it's it's closed at least through today. It was closed yesterday. Uh, the road conditions are terrible, and there's also some danger of uh, rock fall. So they're trying to work on all of that so they can open up the road. But right now, 50 is closed. Um, at the a Little Blue Creek Canyon. Um, so that's about all I have uh, since uh, everything is kind of shut down. Um, Inner Mountain. Good morning, Vince. Um, my apologies for being tardy this morning. I was having some connectivity difficulties. So I am here and uh, just wanted to report that we as well have not had a meeting recently. And as far as Projects are going up in the Inner Mountain. Most of them are reaching completion as far as the maintenance projects are going. And um, as you indicated for Gunnison Valley, the, the big capital projects are heading into the mothball stage for the winter. There are still some challenging um, uh, traveling situations right outside of in between Frisco and Silverthorne where the the road is narrowed uh, to accommodate construction of the ox lane. And then as you go further west, a lot of guardrail projects have been finished or are in completion. Work continues on Glenwood Canyon uh, to mitigate the existing um, challenges associated with rockfall. And so that will continue. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what the status of work through the winter is on that one, but I know that they've been actively working over there. And then as you head further west, uh, we continue to get information and um, projects and plans together 
to um, to uh, finalize some of the work on the interchanges in uh, Silt and Newcastle. And uh, that is about all I've got at this point. And um, so I will, uh, I will defer um, to uh, our next meeting. Thanks, Vince. So, so Ben Lee, are you here or not here? I am, uh, what? Well, are you the stack rep or not? There's yes. A, there's a something going around I, that says that you have left. <laughs> um, well, if I got voted out, then I've left, but um, I had I was unaware of that. Hey, Bentley, this is Terry uh, with the City of Bowman Springs. Um, the IMTPR did meet, um, I think it was last week, and um, they said that you had left your your position and that we needed to have a new chair. Um, I am sorry, you know, if that's not the case, um, but they, they did vote in Brian Pettit is the, you know, the new chair and um, I am the co-chair. Um, if there's been a um, huge misunderstanding, we should um, work on that with um, Ben and correct it if it needs to be corrected. Okay, well, I'll let you guys work that out and let us know what the the real story is. Okay, okay. Mo moving along. North Front Range. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Vince. Um, at our October 6th meeting, we approved the um, North Front Range MPO's greenhouse gas transportation report, as well as the 2045 RTP 2022 update. Um, and additionally, we made a positive conformity determination for the 2045 RTP 2022 update. Um, and then as was mentioned <clears throat> earlier, on October 19th, the Transportation Commission um, had the opportunity to tour the North I-25 project from Denver to Fort Collins, um, including stops to look at uh, two of the mobility hubs and segments six, seven, and eight of the project, which are in progress. And so um, I think that that was a great tour. Uh, we shared with the Transportation Commission that we were able to achieve uh, the success on North I-25 because of $60 million that had been um, provided by local uh, municipalities and, and counties to be able to make that project happen. Otherwise, that project was 30, 40, 50 years out. Um, and so I think that the Transportation Commission was uh, fairly well impressed by the work that we do together regionally to, to make that happen. And um, I understand that we were the first bus tang bus to enter one of the transportation or one of the mobility hubs. So that's, we kind of made history on October 19th with that. Um, but the mobility hubs are great and they will save time for the bus tang routes, especially as those are expanded. So um, it was a great tour and we we're happy to host the Transportation Commission and thank you to CDOT for um, for showing off those projects. Thanks. Um, Northwest. Hi Vince, we did meet last month um, and had a very robust conversation. Um, I'll highlight the majority of it. Um, we had a long conversation around staffing and winter maintenance, upcoming winter maintenance. This probably took about 60% of our time um, from the county commissioners to local representatives. The uh, long short story of the long is that there's a lot of grumblings in Northwest TPR with respect to uh, the lack of employees and how the funding mechanisms are dealt with throughout the state for maintenance employees. Everybody shot the messenger, poor Jason, got it right through the heart, but realized that he was just the messenger. Randy did a really awesome job, the uh, section six supervisor explaining what the issues were. Um, I don't feel as though anybody at the TPR felt satisfied. It was not their fault, but the, even in the budget today, you will see that there is a cost of living study that had been done, but for the I-70 corridor. And so everybody that's going to get hired along I-70 is gonna get a nice little cost of living bump, but 
Nobody that lives in the mountains other than around I-70 is going to get that bump. And a $500 housing stipend for Steamboat Springs and Winter Park isn't going to get you a week's of growth groceries, let alone rent. And so there is a huge differentiation, and that was brought up, um, I think, by every single person on the call. And there were at least 20 people on the call. So I digress and will tell you that up here in Northwest Colorado, they see this as an emergency. And there were talks of bringing out the National Guard. We, the first snowfall, as we all know, is horrible for anybody that lives in this state that doesn't know how to drive. We had three accidents on 131 in less than two hours and had to close our one of our major highways. Uh, we had a rollover truck the same day on, on Ravitters Pass, and it had to close the highway two days later to clean up the rollover. Um, this is something that's constant and ongoing. And when then you filter in no people to help plow those roads, we're having a small issue and it's emergent in our, in our neck of the woods. Uh, conversations. Uh, thank you, Amber, for talking about the Bustang Outrider. Um, there is a, a large need and there is an email that was emailed or, uh, with letters attached to discuss the Outrider and the possibilities to have a Bustang Outrider connect from Craig down 13 to Rifle. Um, this is right. Rio Blanco County is the only county um, that does not have any Bustang Outrider program and therefore cannot get their people to the hospital or to any other type of shopping in Grand Junction or Denver. So hopefully we can solve that for them. Uh, we discussed Vail Pass and the funding shortfalls and what that looks like as a statewide initiative and not a Region 3 initiative. Um, in Region 3, 13 fortification Creek is complete, 64 Rangeley US 40 Dinosaur Overlay is complete, US 40 Sand Springs Craig is complete, uh, 139 Douglas Pass North South Project is com will be complete next week. Um, there's lots of projects on the horizon uh, in the Region 3 West section for next year. Um, and I would say, let's see what else. The takeaway from Northwest TPR is we need to work to be more flexible with our maintenance hiring. And if we're talking budget today, we need to figure out how we can, at least the message conveyed by our people is, we don't wanna keep robbing Peter to pay Paul on the budget line item. We need to increase the maintenance line item and not have this uh, cut into projects and upcoming funding sources this needs to just be a line item increase for winter maintenance. We are in a bad situation here. We're starting a first of four day storm. It's snowing currently and it's not gonna get any better. And we don't have tourists here and we're still having accidents. So that's the takeaway Vince, have a wonderful morning. Well, maybe when we're talking about the budget later on in the meeting, <coughs> We can bring that up and emphasize um, some of our views on housing and how we can keep uh, employees working to keep our roads open. Okay, thanks, Heather. Okay, um, Pikes Peak. Uh, thanks, Vince. Uh, our board of directors uh, met uh, on October 12th. Uh, we had our um, transportation electrification infrastructure study um, adopted. At that meeting, we also released uh, our unified planning work program amendment number two out for public comment. And we also sent out the congestion management process out for uh, public comment. So hopefully um, the the 30 day public comment period kind of couldn't be over by the time we meet again. So we're hoping that uh, those will be adopted at our December meeting. Um, and one other quick thing, uh, hopefully I'm not stepping on anyone or stealing anyone's thunder at CDOT or, or stealing anybody's, uh, 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 stepping anyone's toes or stealing anyone's thunder. That's, that's, the, that's the one I wanted to use. But uh, we, we did learn that uh, Rich Zamora um, is retiring from CDOT as our, uh, our uh, 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 director or regional director. 
Um, and Rich has been here for, I think, right before the, right as the pandemic started. So he, he did not have it easy trying to meet people um, uh, through Zoom, uh, but just uh, did a wonderful job getting all the projects done. So I'd like to yield the rest of my time. Uh, Rich, if you could just, uh, you're kind of the unsung hero. You never really get on camera much, but again, we're going to miss the hell out of you. And uh, I really appreciate everything you've done. So thanks again. Yeah, thank you, John. You know, I really appreciate, you know, the opportunity to work with everybody and our all of our planning partners, you know, that relationship is, is really important and trying to move things forward. So, you know, it's uh, kind of bittersweet for me, but, uh, you know, thank you for all the cooperation from everybody. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Rich. Okay, um, where was it? El Pueblo. Well, we'd like to uh, wish uh, Richard uh, 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 great retirement. We are going to miss him as well. Uh, he does a tremendous job and that's a huge loss for us as well as CDOT in my opinion. Um, we are working on a project here in Pueblo County. Uh, we are doing 1.75 miles of recycled plastic asphalting. Uh, working with a, a local company, Beltramo and Sons is the paving contractor, but a company that moved to Pueblo uh, within the last year and a half, Ecological Materials Corporation. And they are recycling plastics and a lot of the small plastic sacks uh, and using them to um, uh, use them in, in the paving of, of roads. Uh, we're gonna, uh, this is our test project. I, I think that this is one of the longest uh, um, of recycled material uh, pavings that's been done. Uh, we wanna look at this material too, uh, possibly using it in uh, when we start to uh, construct Joe Martinez Boulevard. So uh, uh, that's something that we're uh, proud of. If you want to, you can go to our website and uh, they're doing a video today and probably in the next two or three days, you'll be able to go online, go to our website and you'll be able to look at the video uh, and it will give you some information uh, on how all that's being done. And I, I think that in the next uh, week or so, um, Purcell Boulevard will, um, uh, the overpass will be completed. Uh, and uh, we're really looking forward to that, uh, removing some of the congestion there. So that's all I have. Thank you. Um... Let's see, uh, San Luis Valley. <clears throat> Keith. Hello, good morning. Uh, yeah, Cottonwood <clears throat> Pass is closed for the season now, and uh, which is just in time because we're getting our first really measurable snow here today, uh, at least up here in the north end of Chafee. I'm not sure about Salida. I haven't heard much from down there yet. Uh, the chain up station improvements have been completed and things are being buttoned up for the winter. Uh, we are shifting, of course, this weekend back to standard time from daylight savings time and CDOT and the Colorado State Patrol put out social bulletins yesterday reminding people that the animals are going to continue their pattern of behavior with sun up and sundown and darkness and what have you. Uh, but our driving patterns are going to change, so we need to be alert uh, because we're going to be driving when the animals are moving about more frequently, especially uh, at nighttime and uh, the end of the day. And then, Andy, I think you're still on. Uh, don't forget the Tennessee Pass line and the Front Range Rail. Uh, can't do anything to sever the Tennessee Pass line access forevermore. We are still interested in having some sort of commuter rail and light passenger service on that rail someday, not tomorrow, but someday we'll want it and probably even sooner we'll need it. So that's everything. Thank you. Okay, Keith, when you talk about Cottonwood Pass, you're talking up between Buena Vista and Taylor Park, right? Correct. Because there's a number of Cottonwood Passes in this right. state. So Almost as many as there are Ute Passes. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So the good. one up there good. in the uh, Eagle, I guess it is the one that's going to be the bypass. Uh, 
it always gets people stirred up around here when they hear that, oh, Cottonwood Pass is going to be improved and everything. I said, well, wait, we just did that. And it's like, well, no, that's the other one. <laughs> one of the other. Ones. Right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, South Central. Good morning. Um, we met on October 27th, and I would also like to offer our congratulations to Richard. Um, I've worked with him just for six months being on the TPR, and um, I've appreciated his um, support and his um, professionalism and his feedback and help. So wish him well. Um, he made that announcement at our meeting. Uh, we're also going to be saying goodbye to um, Commissioner Cisneros, who's with Warfano County. This That was his last meeting as well. Um, we'll see who... Um, is the new representative for Warfano County after the elections. Um, because we mentioned uh, the Mustang Outrider uh, program, I did want to highlight that uh, South Central TPR, we do not have our Mustang Outrider up and running at this time. Our buses are purchased, but currently um, they are in operation as part of the Pegasus program on the I-70 corridor. So when um, the Pegasus buses come in, I guess that's when we're going to be receiving ours so we can commence with our program, which we've been waiting for for a number of years. Other than that, um, we're, we wrapped up for the year and we'll have our next meeting in January. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Southeast. Good morning. I'm sorry I joined late. Um, we had our meeting on October 26th and we reviewed projects that were in progress as well as, as those is, that are coming up. US 287 passing lanes are completed. We had four of those. We had US 50 Timber Bridge completed and then US 287 through Lamar is making great progress. West lanes are just about completed and getting ready to move over to the east side of the street. Uh, our upcoming projects include surface treatments, bridges, uh, storm sewers. And then we also discuss changes and additions to our 23 to 27 STIP that were voted on and approved. And just like everyone else, we'd like to express um, our thanks to Rick for his work in the Southeast. We're gonna miss him and we wish him well. And then our next meetings in January, that's all I have. Okay. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Southwest. Good morning, everybody. Again, yeah, um, we did have the opportunity to meet on October 13th. A um, few of the things that we discussed, uh, obviously, were uh, some CDL training that we're working with down here with uh, Region 9. Uh, a few updates that we might look at trying to add to our 10-year plan. Uh, a construction update. Obviously, everything is uh, slowing down and getting ready to close down to the winter. It's raining down here, uh, which is which is good. But one of the biggest things that that we had a conversation on was uh, um, basically the broadband office and CDOT as far as how that partnership is going to work moving forward. Um, don't know how it is with you all up there or wherever you're at, but. That was probably one of our biggest uh, conversation pieces that we had. And really that's about it. Thanks guys. Thank you. Okay, uh, upper front range. All right, good morning. I don't think Commissioner James has been able to join us yet, um, but I know many of you probably know that uh, he was best friends with Hugh McKean. And so I'm sure he would have appreciated that tribute this morning. Um, and I also uh, know that uh, the governor has agreed to um, do a, he's arranged for um, Minority Leader McKean to lie in state at the Capitol Rotunda on November 10th. And so if you have the opportunity to participate in that ceremony, um, I'm sure Commissioner James uh, would appreciate that. Um, and I just ask that you keep Commissioner James in your prayers too, he, as he's going through this, this grieving time. We have not had an upper front range meeting um this month but we are um meeting with the 34 coalition this week because we are looking at a transportation management organization that could span from the north front range into the upper front range uh, we have that meeting this afternoon to talk about that as well as i want to give a shout out to heather and her team and thank uh, the region four staff for the quick turnaround in the response on the rural surface transportation grant that morgan county had submitted 
Um, we're hoping to hear good news uh, in the next month or so on that rural application. Morgan County um, applied for approximately $35 million for improvements on what we call phase four of I-76. And uh, we think that um, them reaching out to Morgan County was a, a good sign, hopefully, for um, following up. And so we had a quick turnaround on, on getting responses back to them. So I just wanna thank um, Region 4 for the help on that. Our next meeting is December 1st, um, we, uh, which I think is also our next staff meeting. So we won't be able to give you even an update for that one until since our meetings afterwards. Uh, but we are anticipating, um, as many of you know, the um, ozone non-attainment boundary incorporates all of Wealth County now. And so we are looking at putting our transportation conformity uh, memorandum of understanding on that agenda for adoption. And I just want to thank the other agencies for getting it all executed. Uh, we're kind of the last one on the list to to get it complete. So we'll we'll have that done. And of course, I know Commissioner James would um, also want to give a shout out and thank everybody for the the CDOT tour with the Transportation Commission um, on that because I know I know that he. Uh, if you saw the presentation last night too with CDOT and the pictures and stuff, it, it's really great. And so we just want to thank everybody for their their help in coordinating that. So thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, Southern U. Ute Mountain. John Cater. Bill, do you, do you have something else you want to report? No, Vince, I'm good. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, Kristen Kenyon. Okay. Um, so that brings us to transit in Colorado. Um, Ann Rajeski. Hi, Vince. Hey, there she is. Thanks for having me today. I'm excited to share a little bit about transit here today. Um, do you have the slides going? We, um, before, as the slides get up, I'll let you know, Casta is a, um, for a transit association, we have um, about 55 transit agency members from around the state, ranging from RTD, our largest member. Um, but we also have resort agencies as members, uh, small agency, agencies on the East Slope and or the Eastern Plains and the Western Slope. So we represent a lot of different um, transit needs in our communities here in the state. Uh, next slide. I wanted to share a little bit with you around some transit wins, which some of these you're very aware of, but there's been increased funding at the federal level for transit, which is really exciting. And one of the things that makes it really exciting here in our state is that um, those areas align with some of the state's focus, like electric transit vehicles and facilities and general formula funding, which is been really valuable as we ramp up back from COVID. Um, I wanted to mention too that Colorado received funding for six transit projects through the 2021 congressionally directed spending process. Um, in this last year, we have one agency that um, is part of the bill, but because of the continuing resolution, um, we're not in a position yet where we know if um, the project's gonna make it through on the bill. And then um, we're also excited about increased and new state funding for transit and multimodal projects and transportation. All right, next slide. I wanted to share too a little bit about the challenges facing transit. These are a lot of new challenges that we haven't seen before. But as I've been listening to um, the check-ins from the different areas of the state, you're all starting to feel this or have felt 
this for a while. So the challenges we're seeing in terms of supply chain issues and material cost increases are um, they're hitting the transit area too, where small buses, the ones, the body and chassis vehicles have increased, their cost has increased by up to 60% per vehicle. And it's been really challenging. Um, the large buses, the cost has increased by 10 to 15%. The materials for facility construction have increased exponentially. And these all have really big ramifications on transit agencies, but also DTR. And I just want to um, thank DTR for their work and their thoughtful um, consideration as they try to put together the grant request that two months ago made sense and were appropriate. And then they find out, you know, when they're trying to get ready to award that the buses cost so much more than expected and trying to scramble and see how we can make these vehicle grants whole. And so it's been a really big challenge for DTR and I'm just really thankful for their efforts to make this all work because it's a much bigger project problem than Colorado, obviously. And so, you know, they're doing what they can, but the reality is we do, we have, along with the cost increases, we're also seeing that buses are being delivered later, canceled. Orders have been canceled, not so much in Colorado, but in some other states I've heard about um, bus manufacturers just reaching out and saying, well, we're just not going to be able to fill that order, which puts that agency kind of back at the end of the line to ask for um, to purchase their new buses. And then... Um, one of the other concerning parts is the thought is if buses aren't being delivered, you can already see we're flexing buses from here to there. Agencies are running into situations where their spares are all being used because all the vehicles are getting older and maybe beyond their useful life. They spend more time in the maintenance facility. That means they need more spares, but you can't get spares and bus parts are hard to come by. So a lot of challenges that have impacts to um, transit agencies in the state. I did hear one, one sad situation um, in one of our agencies where they ended up running a minivan on one of their routes because all of their buses and all of their spares were either in use or in the maintenance facility. So it's serious business. And um, I know DTR is doing what they can do, Casto. We're doing what we can do to connect folks who have extra vehicles to, to folks who need extra vehicles and trying to figure out how to make all the pieces work. And then along with that, we also are seeing staffing challenges at all levels of our agencies. Um, and you all know about staffing costs and how the cost for housing is increasing, <laughs> cost for groceries, and people just need more money in order to be able to live. And that's particularly challenging in resort communities in Colorado, but also starting to be challenging in other places as well. One of the things many of our agencies are looking at is an affordable workforce housing and trying to figure out if there's ways, if we're building a facility already, or if we have some match funding, whether there's funding opportunities for providing that sort of workforce housing. All right, next slide. I just wanted to give a brief overview of how things look post COVID. Um, and you may have seen bits and pieces of this, but um, it, you know what we've seen in terms of urban agencies is that they are continuing to experience reduced ridership. And some of that is due to hybrid work schedules. If the park and ride I go to here in Denver on Mondays, there's not as many cars as there are on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And then Friday again, it's a slow day for the park and ride. And so I think there's a good number of folks that continue to have some sort of hybrid situation. Resort agencies, some of these folks experienced higher ridership during COVID than ever before because people were feeling safe to participate in outdoor recreation. Um, also, more people are living in second homes and that has impacts on that community and who's riding the vehicles and the service industry in that community. And obviously service industry workers are not 
the sort of workers that um, can have a hybrid schedule. They need to be at their job and they need to be there on time and and they need a ride home. So that's an interesting situation in resort areas where they're seeing um, increased ridership. Rural area rural agencies um, have a couple different experiences in our state. Some are back to where they were pre-COVID. Many are above where they were pre-COVID. Um, others are, are um, seeing lower ridership. So there's a pretty big spread in terms of our rural areas in our state. All right, next slide. Oh, I don't know if we got the video going. It doesn't look like you have the link. Is it working? This is a little um, a little video that we put together for um, rural agencies in the state and agencies other than RTD to use for their um, Facebook marketing. And if you'll notice, the little city or townscape behind there was um, tailored to each community. And so like this is La Junta, Colorado's community and you'll notice it doesn't have mountains. It has a smaller vehicle, this sort of vehicle they drive. This is kind of a riff off of what RTD did, but RTD obviously has more of a um, metro cityscape, larger vehicles. So we tried to be sensitive to the, um, the sort of community that we are representing. I wanted to share a little bit about the Zero Fair August program and, and how things shook out after the fact here. Um, we had 14 agencies participating, plus one agency that self-funded. Um, 17 agencies are already fear-free year-round, so that gave us more than 30 agencies that were fear-free during the month of August. A number of agencies that we were hoping would participate were not able to. Um, part of the problem was that the funding became available very very soon or right before the right before August. So essentially we got funding in July. We went through the um, administration application process in as early as we could in July, but it didn't give us a lot of time to figure out um, uh, naughty issues with agencies that were having challenges. Agencies were not able to participate because some just didn't have enough bus drivers. Um, RAFTA, for instance, was already in a position where they had standing room only on their vehicles and they were concerned if they went for free, they would get a lot more folks wanting to ride and they did not have the backup drivers to be able to provide the level of service that would be necessary. Um, and also for some of those larger agencies, uh, not having staff in all the different roles made it really hard to do the logistics of it. And then also, like I said before, not enough time to put the overflow measures into place. So some agencies were able to do with like their accessible ADA program, they were able to put an overflow measure um, in case there was um, increased ridership. And those sorts of rides really depend on a good number of vehicles and drivers. So those were the challenges folks face this year. All right, next slide. Uh, this is an interesting slide that we just put together. It shows you um, the percent change between July and August and then August and September. And you'll see that the blue lines are all um, above, it. they all felt some sort of increase, the agencies that participated. Um, you can see some agencies had pretty shockingly high um, increases in their ridership. And this is a program that really made a difference. And we hear antidotally that for many of those agencies, especially smaller ones where they know their um, riders well, that there were new folks on the bus trying it out, which is just perfect and just what we all wanted to see. And then you can see from August to September, some agencies continued to go up, but most um, saw a little bit of a loss in um, ridership. 
from the August numbers. All right, next slide. I, this is an interesting slide that you can look at later at your leisure, but it just tells you the grant, grant amount and the reimbursement amount. What I think it highlights is the fact that some agencies didn't know what, um, what sort of increase they would really see, and so went above and beyond in terms of the numbers of riders. And because we were not, because we had a number of agencies that weren't able to participate this year, we were able to fulfill their request, even if it went above and beyond what their, um, their grant request was originally. All right, next slide. We did a quick program debrief. Um, the little photo there on the left-hand side is from La Junta, Colorado. They, um, their preschool and um, summer programs used their buses to take kids to the swimming pool or to the library for different programs. And so they did a little um, event around Zero Fair August to, uh, recognize their youngest writers um, in their system. And so they had a real cute day. They make all the kids raise their hands to make sure that their um, to make sure that their um, seat belts are buckled. So it's real cute. Um, so some good things about the program. People felt like it was easy to apply and get reimbursed. CASTA had put together a marketing plan, a marketing toolkit that was available for all the agencies to access and folks felt that was helpful. They don't necessarily have marketing staff on their team that would be able to put something like that together. Radio and Facebook ads um, were helpful to boost their ridership, spread the word. Um, they would like to see us start the planning earlier for 2023 and um, a number of agencies underestimated their ridership increase. So we have a lot of good information going into 2023. All right, next slide. Uh, there's some really nice comments and stories and quotes. Um, a lot of people were really excited and it was nice to see them talking about accessing work and the gym and running their kids around town, which is great. Um, some of the agencies were able to add a new route and kind of test it out, which was um, a really interesting way to um, go about that. Typically it's much more planning and you get five years of funding and all that kind of stuff, but it's a nice way to, to kind of see how that works and whether the community really adopts that new route. So some interesting comments there that you can all read through later. All right, next one. Uh, Oh, this slide got left in um, accidentally. All right, so that's all I had to share today. Um, let me know though, if you have any questions or would like to see any additional information. I should mention that um, the slide where I wrote the grant request, there's three agencies we're still trying to nail down the numbers um, uh, for, the final for the final reimbursement. So um, if you're looking for completely final numbers, you'll have to give us a few more days and then we can share those with you. Any questions? Questions for me. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Um, well, I think it was, it seems like it was really largely successful. I think that, you know, ridership went up in a lot of areas. And um, so do you think that this is something that will happen next year? Well, the bill covers two years of funding. Oh, so, it does. Okay. Yeah. So we are. It will happen next year. <laughs> it will happen next year. And we're excited because I think with time on our side, we're gonna be able to offer um, agencies that are interested a three month program so that they can go fair free June, July, and August. And some agencies are really interested in that to use it as a pilot program to see how much would ridership increase over a three month period if we went fair free and what does that mean for going fair free year round? So we're, I know a, a number of agencies are really interested in that. And do you, um, because there were agencies that weren't able to participate this time around, do you feel like you can get them into the program for this, this coming year then? Yeah, I'm really hopeful. 
Okay. I've heard, um, we had our fall conference a few weeks ago and I heard really hopeful things about people being able to, to hire drivers, um, which is really key to making this work. And the other piece is that, you know, with that ADA stuff and putting some, some backup plans into place, there just wasn't time for that. Um, when we, you know, cause the money wasn't available until July one and the program started August one. So it didn't give a lot of space for, for being creative and making things work. And then just, I'm sorry. Um, one last question on the supply chain kind of issues. Do you, is there any relief that can happen with the, fe is the federal government, you know, working on that is, I mean, it sounds like it's across the country. So, um, you know, as we, as we compete for these grant dollars and then maybe get them and then don't have you know, buses to purchase. I mean, that that seems like it's a big problem. So, do you do you know of any efforts that are happening on the national level regarding Thank that you. situation? Okay. Yeah, I was on I was on the call with FTA Region Eight um, last week, and the FTA is taking this pretty seriously. There's, um, you know, there's a shortage of chassis, and they're only made by one company here in the U.S. That you know, so there's issues like that. And then there's like the computer chip issues. Like there's a number of pieces that are challenging. And I think the FTA is doing what they can. Last um, last week, they also came out with a Buy America waiver for certain types of vehicles in order to see if we can go beyond our typical um, purchasing solutions and find some um, that may not that may not fit the Buy America during this time. And so I think the FTA is um, on the job and trying to figure out solutions too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dana. Uh, yeah, so we are one of the agencies that, that did not participate, as you know, um, <laughs> and largely because of the paratransit increase we were worried about. And so I was wondering if you guys kept track of like the increase in paratransit ridership versus fixed route ridership just to kind of give us an idea like if we were to go to fare free maybe some percent increases that we would have to plan for because that's always our fear as we go fare free is just that ada implication to be able to serve those riders as well yeah and we do have some um good information that we can share we're still kind of collecting all the fine-tuning the information we're sharing about or we're collecting about ridership but i think um we have some really good information from mountain metro that might relate to you and i think we could get the same sort of information from greeley evans transit and pueblo to see the impacts they felt but that's the that's one of the pieces that I think when we go into 2023, we'll have a much better idea. And we're talking about having a calculator on the application that just says, you know, what percentage you should at least be thinking this percent, <laughs> because yeah. that's, you know, kind of the median percentage increase, because that was the piece that I think was hardest to know what it was going to look mm -hmm. like around the state. And, and sure enough, it was challenging. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Keith. Hi, thank you. Good presentation there. Uh, have a few questions. Uh, one, there were four slides that I didn't have or uh, in my packet that was emailed out. And I was hoping you can make those available because we have some real transit zealots uh, in the San Luis Valley TPR. And you're probably aware that the Chafee shuttle provides some of the transit services in the Northern San Luis Valley. And so we're always looking for additional resources, but uh, the four that I'm looking for, the ridership survey, the grant requests and reimbursement amounts, the 2022 program debrief, and comments, stories, and quotes. And if you could send a link direct to that video, that the embedded video that didn't run, if you've got it on uh, a YouTube channel or somewhere else, uh, that would be sure. very helpful. Yeah, I can share all that with you. I'm sorry those slides came late. We were, um, we have just been collecting the last of that information this last week. So we thought it would yeah. be better to share it than get it to you early and not share it. <laughs> sure thing. Yeah, it happens. 
Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Please forgive my tardiness today. I, in fact, I just uh, joined uh, partway through uh, Anne's presentation. And it's ironic that uh, as you were wrapping up, I received this news flash on my phone from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, breaking news, Lyft is cutting hundreds of jobs or 13% of staff, people familiar with the matter say. It's the company's second round of layoffs at the company in recent, uh, in recent months. So in the private sector, we're cutting 13% of a transit style job. Who pays for uh, ride uh, free? Well, the, the, so the funding that came, um, the funding came from Senate Bill 180, Senate Bill 22-180. Uh, the people, the taxpayers pay for ride free. Um, can you help me in, in understanding what happens when the Senate Bill money runs out? Well, this program was slated to be a two-year program. And so we had a certain amount allotted for 2022 and a certain amount allotted for 2023. And so I think what we're trying to be careful in our messaging is making sure people understand this isn't, and it's similar to how we did, you know, this is just August. It's not fair free for the year. It's just this kind of promotional situation for August. And sure, a couple so, of questions before me were asking about your you know, all the time fair free. And so that would be an interesting economic model. Yeah, interesting. I mean, that's part of why I put the slide in there about the reimbursement amount, because it's interesting. You know, transit is um, supported through federal funding and local funding. In our state, we don't have a very large share, although it's been growing in past years of state funding. And so um, it's interesting to see what portion of transit funding is really um, paid for by actual fares. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? And then you say you had 14, 14 agencies participate in 17 that are already free? Yep. Yeah, if you go to our website under um, resources, we have a zero fare page and we have a map on there of all the agencies that um, participated in August. And then if you click on the map, you can go to the to the live information and um, a listing and it shows you which agencies are fair free year round and which agencies were fair free in August. So, so have, have the Do you ones want me to drop the link in there? Oh, no, that's okay. Um, have you talked to the ones who do charge a fare and talk to them about thinking about free fare all the time? Well, you know, that's a really big national conversation right now. And I think um, a lot of people are actually, I was at a national conference in August and people were already like, ooh, when are you going to share the information about Colorado and how the different types of agencies, you know, how much increase or decrease they got. And and so people are really watching because it's a, it's a national level conversation and it's really complicated um, in the same way a lot of things are, where if you provide something for free, do people take it as seriously or does it um, start looking like something it's not? Like even for our training programs, for instance, we charge a nominal fee because that way we know people will show up. And so there's a lot of debate about what that what that does and what that means to a community. But in Colorado, we have a lot of great examples of agencies that are fair free and have been for a really long time. And it's supportive of the, you know, in the resort areas, it's really supportive of the tourist industry and getting those workers, service workers to their jobs in order to serve the tourists. And so it's a really complicated question, but um, something that a lot of people are wrestling with right now. Well, that's good. Okay, any other questions for Ann? Thanks, Ann. Nice to see you again. Yeah, nice to see you too. Thanks for having me. Okay, uh, next item on the agenda is uh, the budget update. Yes, uh, hey, good morning. So you heard that both transit 
And one of the reports from one of the TPRs talking about um, housing. And I know that there's a couple of po points in the budget that talk about some housing things, but that's somewhat limited. So that may come up. Okay, right. Jeff. Good morning. Um, thank you, Vince. Uh, all right. If, um, I'm not sure who's driving. Aaron, are you driving? Could you advance us a slide? So uh, good morning. It's, uh, it is budget season again. And so today I'm going to present to you on the draft fiscal year 24 budget. Um, got a little agenda in front of uh, you. Um, we'll start with an updated revenue forecast and then I'll brief you on the proposed budget. Uh, then we'll put this in the context of the overall budget development process and talk timeline and next steps. Um, we will be asking the commission to approve this as a draft budget this month. Um, however, we are really at the early end of the budget cycle. There's still a lot of moving parts and decisions ahead. Um, and we won't approve the final budget until March. So we'll be back uh, um, at least another time or two before the budget gets finalized. But we do have to approve a draft budget um, this month in order to meet some uh, uh, statutory deadlines to, uh, to submit a draft budget. Uh, let's go ahead to the next slide. Um, I'll start with an updated HUTF forecast. Um, this is our, our quarter one fiscal year 23 HUTF forecast. Um, you'll note that the forecast is broken down between motor fuel taxes, uh, vehicle registration, faster fees, and the new retail delivery and road usage fees. Um, keep in mind, this is just HUTF, so it's just one piece of our revenue forecast, um, but it is an important piece. Um, so this doesn't include any uh, general fund, enterprise funds, special programs, or federal funds, and so forth. Um, just looking at the HUTF, we're forecasting about $530 million in the current fiscal year, uh, and then about $588 million in fiscal year 24, six hundred and fifteen in fiscal year 25. Um, you can see revenues are anticipated to increase nearly $60 million between fiscal year 23 and 24. Uh, this is largely due to increased revenue from the faster fees, uh, as the fees go back up after being reduced by Senate Bill 260, uh, as well as uh, new revenue flowing from the road usage fee. Um, unfortunately, I'll say that again, this is just one piece of the puzzle. This doesn't mean that overall state revenues are up uh, because you're only seeing the HUTF portion here, uh, not, uh, not some other sources such as general fund that have gone up and down, but it is, uh, is showing a positive trend uh, over the next few years with respect to the HUTF. And I'll also notice, note that um, our collections from motor fuel taxes, uh, which we, we saw depressed for a little while during and post pandemic, um, have largely stabilized and are, are back up at, uh, at uh, pre pandemic levels uh, or close there too. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. So that last slide was the CDOT share of the HUTF. This slide shows total statewide HUTF, comparing our forecast to forecast by uh, the Legislative Council and the Office of State Planning and Budget. Um, our forecast is a little more conservative than Legislative Council, but tracks pretty closely to the, the uh, OSPB forecast. Um, I'll also note that both state forecasts show that state revenue will be surpassing uh, the referendum, referendum D Tabor cap uh, uh, in fiscal year 23 and fiscal year 24. Um, while this doesn't directly impact uh, CDOT, uh, it does put uh, pressure on the general fund uh, that, uh, that of course, uh, uh, could result in trade-offs that impact uh, subs general fund transfers that we're anticipating in subsequent years. Let's go ahead to the next slide. So um, moving on to the budget. Uh, the budget uh, is, uh, the, the fiscal year 24 budget is built in part on that uh, uh, current uh, HUTF forecast, as well as forecasts for other revenues. Um, this gives you just a little bit of an overview of what makes up our budget. Um, you can access our complete budget document at the link here. I think that link is also in your packet. Um, also note that while our budget discussions uh, with the TC focus heavily on the revenue allocation plan or what we refer to as our, our one sheet budget, uh, the complete budget is a much larger document that includes multiple additional elements, including a detailed summary of each revenue source, uh, each CDOT program, uh, and a number of additional appendices, including a spending plan, which really outlines what we anticipate actual expenditures will be uh, during the course of the fiscal year based on uh, revenue 
received during the fiscal year as well as available cash balances. Let's go to the next slide. So in fiscal year 24, we are forecasting total revenue of uh, approximately 1.835 uh, million or 1.8 billion. Um, about uh, 826 million or 45% of that revenue is from federal programs. So that's the orange on the left here. Uh, a little less than a third, about 32% is from the HUTF. That's the forecast we started, uh, started with. Uh, about 8% is from the Bridge and Tunnel Enterprise. That is that first uh, gray bar that uh, doesn't have a number on it. Um, and then the remaining 15% is everything you see to the, uh, to the far right. The, that remaining 15% come from a variety of sources, including aeronautics revenue uh, and revenue to the, uh, the other CDOT enterprises. Let's go to the next slide. So this next slide shows shows how those allocate dollars are allocated across our major program categories in the proposed fiscal year 24 budget. Uh, starting with the blue, about 40% is allocated to our capital construction programs. Um, about 25% or a little over 450 million uh, is allocated to maintenance and operations. And about 20%, that's the orange, is passed through to our locals via sub to locals via our suballocated programs. That's uh, about 367 million. Um, collectively, these three big three categories uh, represent about 85% of our allocated revenue. Um, off to the uh, to the to the right, you'll see the remaining 15% is uh, is composed of uh, administration, um, debt service, contingency. Uh, multimodal services and other programs uh, such as our safety education program or our planning and research program. All right, let's go ahead one slide. So taking a closer look at our revenue allocation plan, and again, this is the document many of you know as the one sheet budget. Um, it, uh, if, if you were here in person, I'd have a hard copy for you, but we're not here in person. So you will have to pull it up on the web um, using the link in your memo. Um, uh, Although we are currently balanced with allocations uh, uh, aligned with revenues forecasted, as I noted, there are still a number of changes that will occur throughout the rest of the budget cycle. Um, I want to spend just a minute talking a little bit about how uh, our budget comes together. Um, first, flexible revenue, that, that's the revenue that, that uh, we have optionality in terms of how we allocate. Um, flexible revenue in, is initially allocated based on prior year amounts. Um, Later in the budget cycle, we then consider decision items, which could result in changes to those allocations, uh, increasing or decreasing, for example, uh, the amount of funds we might have allocated to a program like surface treatment or to maintenance, which I know there's a lot of interest in. Um, I'll note that a large portion of our budget is composed of inflexible revenue sources. Uh, those are state or federal programs that are required by law and which have dedicated revenue sources. Um, examples of this would be a number of our federal programs like HSIP and CMAC, uh, or state programs like revitalizing main streets. Um, for those programs, there's really no dis allocation decision to be made. Uh, the funds are simply allocated to those programs as required by law uh, based on the anticipated or forecasted revenue uh, associated with those programs. Um, the other significant input to the budget is our asset management planning totals. This, these are developed a few years in advance so we can plan our program of projects and then are carried forward in the budget. Um, our asset management planning totals would be our planned or proposed amounts for uh, our core asset management programs like surface treatment, bridge, uh, geohazards, uh, et cetera. We develop those in, in advance. Um, actually, DTD, the Division of Transportation Development, uh, works with the budget office to, uh, to develop those a few years in advance. And then when we get to the actual budget year, uh, we, we start uh, the budget with the, that is our starting point for our asset management uh, uh, programs. Um, in total, our fiscal year 24 revenue allocation plan totals, again, about 1.835 billion. About 1.6 billion of that is CDOT, uh, and about 238 million uh, is, is, are, are the revenues within the four CDOT and affiliated enterprises. That's Bridge and Tunnel, uh, the Colorado Transportation Invent Investment Office, formerly known as HPTE, uh, and the new non-attainment and clean transit enterprises. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. 
All right, so this next slide provides just a little more detail again on, on how the budget comes together. Um, again, much of our budget is inflexible and tied to dedicated uh, revenue sources that are simply allocated as forecasted. Um, some programs are carried forward from prior level, year levels, but then can be modified during the budget process through a decision item. Uh, we also have internal CDOT budget processes to develop our internal agency operations and administration budget, which then uh, is carried forward in this document. Um, we establish our debt service budget uh, simply based on our, our debt service schedules. And again, our asset management budgets are, are developed um, or are based uh, at least initially on our previously established planning budgets, but then can be modified later in the budget cycle. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, with the next couple of slides, I have just a few highlights that I wanna point out, um, kind of some of the more major or interesting things happening within the fiscal year 24 budget. Um, first, uh, and I made a reference to this earlier when we were talking about the forecast, um, there, there are a number of different moving pieces related to the reduction in faster fees. Um, as I noted, Senate Bill 260 uh, temporarily reduced the road safety surcharge fee, which is the fee that funds the faster safety program for two years. Um, subsequently, House Bill uh, uh, 1351 uh, essentially extended uh, that reduction. Um, and, uh, and that created a, a shortfall for the faster safety program. Um, the, the shortfall was about 36.9 million in the current fiscal year and uh, about 10.2 million in the next fiscal year. Um, fiscal year 24, which again is the budget we are developing right now. Um, we did receive a general fund transfer in fiscal year 23 to help offset that. Um, that was a transfer of 47.1 million, which was meant to cover both the impact in fis the current fiscal year as well as next fiscal year. So what you'll see on this slide is that we've got about 10.2 million in the current fiscal year that, uh, that of, the, of that backfill that we're essentially rolling into fiscal year 24. Uh, and uh, when taken this alongside the, uh, the faster fee revenue uh, in 24, it will keep our faster safety program whole. Um, and then as we move into fiscal year 25, the next budget year, the, the fee reduction uh, is, uh, is no longer in place and we should see our faster revenues uh, restored uh, to, to historic projected levels. Um, now, next slide, um, and I heard the, uh, comments uh, earlier about MLOS, so good that I've got a slide uh, on uh, on maintenance. Um, so I will say that um, historically our maintenance budget was developed as part of that asset management planning process. Um, uh, we are still uh, looking to that asset management planning process for the maintenance budget, but we have been over the last several years uh, endeavoring to make upward adjustments to that maintenance budget uh, in large part to keep up with escalating uh, costs of labor, housing, et cetera. Um, so you know, this kind of shows you sort of how we've increased above our base. Um, we, uh, we started with an initial planning budget of about 269 for our maintenance levels of service program, which is our, our, the bulk of our, our on the ground maintenance uh, activities. Um, in, this current fiscal year budget, we increased that by about six point oh, by about six million above that approved planning amount uh, to to keep up with salary increases that we put in place for our TM one our, our uh, uh, entry level maintenance position and to keep ahead uh, of across the board salary increases that were improved for all state employees. Um, these increases were intended to be ongoing. And so we're carrying that $6 million increase uh, forward again this year. Um, we've also added an additional 3 million uh, to help fund some of the new um, uh, programs we're putting in place related to housing, uh, including our housing stipend program. So that brings us up to a planned budget of about 278 in MLOS for fiscal year 24. Uh, which I believe is the highest uh, highest level of funding we have had to this point uh, for our maintenance level of service program. Um, I will also note that, um, as I indicated earlier, this is early in the budget cycle, so this is not yet final. As we move forward, as we get into uh, January, February, um, a couple other moving parts start to settle in, we will have discussions about whether we need to and are able to increase that further 
Um, but I am happy that at this point in the cycle, we have been able to get that up uh, um, uh, uh, again to a higher level than uh, the prior fiscal year. Okay, I think I have just a couple more slides and uh, then I'll wrap up. Um, the um, um, So as I noted, it's still early in the budget cycle and there's a lot more uh, to come. So we'll be back uh, early in the next calendar year with some of those updates. Uh, among those items still ahead, uh, I noted a few times decision items. We'll review decision items uh, with the commission in February. Um, that includes both administrative decision items, such as requests to increase funding for internal initiatives um, or increases for the operating budget of a, of a particular division. But it also includes decision items related to core programs, such as a request to increase MLOS funding uh, or, or our surface treatment budget, for example. Um, we'll also see updates to common policy from the state. Those are sort of the, the elements of our budget that are handed down to us from the state, things like uh, uh, the uh, cost of living increases for state employees or what we pay for um, uh, services of the uh, AG's office. Um, we'll also look at our maintenance reserve and contingency allocations um, based on budget needs and, and current balances in those programs, which could lead us to allocate some of those funds out to other programs to maybe make increases elsewhere in the budget. Um, finally, we'll update our revenue forecast uh, again in January, which could impact uh, how much funds are or are not available uh, for us to uh, to address decision items or, or other other elements of uh, the budget still in flux. All right, one more slide and then I will be happy to take some questions. Um, in terms of timeline, again, this month we'll ask for the TC's approval of the draft proposed budget so we can submit it to the Office of State Planning and Budget for a December deadline. Um, and then we'll be back in the January, February timeline with additional changes and deci decision items, all of which leads up to uh, approval of the final budget in March. So um, I did see um, a uh, um, I did see a question from John, and I, I'm happy to take that, and then uh, happy to hear what uh, uh, what other questions you might have. Um, so John, John had asked about uh, if, is there an easy place to see the total impact of Senate Bill 260? Um, there, there's um, we do have good data available on the forecasted amount. Uh, of revenue coming out of Senate Bill 260. And we have been tracking, um, actually DOR provides on a monthly basis, uh, sort of collections to date relative to those forecasts. And I'd be happy to share uh, some of that with you, John. Yeah, uh, thanks Jeff. Cause, cause correct me if I'm wrong, of the different enterprises, um, one runs through transportation, but one runs through uh, CDPHC and the other one runs through um, uh, energy office, that kind of thing. So I just yep. wanting to try to think that, but you've, you've got something that you can send us. That would be great. Thank you. Yep. Happy to do that. Okay. That, that other question. Thing. Yep. Other questions and comments. Oh, I'm going to comment. Um, <laughs> so I, yeah, thank you. I read this extensively, sent this out to my uh, TPR people. And I think, you know, I understand that the TM1 levels are what they are and you, you know, it's kind of bound by the state. I think we have a two phased issue and concern. The first is short near term with this budget that you're proposing in the sense that we need to figure out maintenance. This is health and safety emergency situation at this point for this coming year. And the fact that you're looking at maintenance reserve and contingency funds for other projects is not gonna be tolerated. I, I did not say that, Heather. Okay, I mean, that, well, it says that it could be looked at for other projects. And I wanna make sure that we're not looking at things for other projects when we aren't able to pay our people to live in these communities and, and maintain our roads this winter. And next you're, mis winter. you're misinterpreting that. Okay. Well then please define how that looks. So I'll, I'll address that, that piece specifically. The, at this point in the budget cycle, we have, we have funds that we put into the contingency as essentially balancing, right? We leave a certain amount available. As we move through the budget cycle, 
We'll update revenue forecasts. Think we will receive additional common policy. We will see things go up and potentially down. And so as we go, those but those uh, that area is where we finalize. We also have existing balances in the maintenance reserve program. So part of that is that we're not we do not set the final amount for that program until we're further in the year because. Once we get to the final budget, we will know how much we have used in the current fiscal year and if we need to increase that or decrease that. Okay. So there is not that does not mean that we are taking funds away from maintenance. It is just indicating that that is still in flux and that depending on where we are at the in the course of the fiscal year, that could go up or it could go down. Okay, and then I guess I have a follow-up question with respect to your um, slide on um, your increases i guess i would like to know if you could tell us what those increases are with respect to inflationary measures because i don't know if that really cuts the cake with what we're looking at with inflation for the next year oh the increases on the maintenance category yeah okay so if you were to look at that if that were to go from a 269 million to 78. Um, I believe you are, I mean, you are correct. I don't know that you could say that that keeps up entirely with inflation. That's 3%. Um, I will say though, that in general, uh, we are not able to keep up with inflation in, in most of our programs. Um, and so we are, again, trying to keep up with the labor costs. We're trying to allocate as, as much as we can to keep up to ma with maintenance, um, uh, the maintenance requests for budget. Um, but I will also say that, um, you know, funds are finite as are flexible state funds. Federal funds cannot be used for maintenance and operations activities. Uh, what that means is our flexible HUTF funds um, are, are, are stretched among a lot of different purposes, uh, including matching, re hitting required amounts of match on federal programs and maintenance and operations. So uh, we absolutely are trying to keep up with maintenance costs, but I will also say that, um, the inability to use federal funds uh, for maintenance, uh, as well as the inability to use uh, other state funds that are that are um, legislatively assigned to specific purposes, uh, does mean that we we do not have uh, um, unlimited ability to sort of allocate funds to maintenance. And I see Herman's got a trying to jump in. Hey, Herman. Yeah, thanks. I want to just talk about a couple of the, the things that we are doing with maintenance. I, and I, I appreciate, Heather, what you're saying. Um, it is a need area, obviously, and it's something that we need to continue to work on. I, I take a bit of exception with the, you know, there's a health and safety um, emergency right now. And we're doing, I think, an amazing amount of work. Director Liu and John in particular and our, our HR director have been working. This has been their number one priority for the year. Um, we've always implemented shift surges to I-70 and the I-70 area. We're doing that again. We have 40 maintainers that just actually had a nice lunch with John and uh, Shoshana earlier this week to, to bring them all on board. We've always done that. They always support secondary roads like 40 and nine and 82 and others. Uh, we're doing it a little differently this, this year that I think will make it a little bit more effective. Um, we've ramped up recruiting in the last two months. We've hired 68 new maintainers. I think that's a pretty big deal. Um, one of the challenges and, you know, our uh, cast of <laughs> Ren Ann can, can say the same thing, I think, about, about CDLs for, for bus drivers. But CDOT isn't just looking for CDL drivers. We've created a CDL training program. Our first one, I think we had 10 people. The next one, we had 20. Um, I think this one is either 30 or 40. So we've, we've uh, gone that extra step that I would assume most organizations aren't doing where we're saying, if you come work with us, we will get you your CDL. We will train you to get your CDL. Uh, from a housing stipend standpoint, uh, the I-70 corridor is going from, and this is a little different because it, you know, the summer months and winter months, I think for the I-70 corridor are a little bit different, um, but up to a $2,000 uh, stipend each month, housing stipend, that's a $24,000 a year. And, and most of that, I think it was $800 in the summer and something more in the winter. There's some areas, uh, Steamboat 
area. I think getting a thousand dollar stipend. Oh, five hundred. Some of them are five hundred. I think there's some that are that are higher. I could be wrong, um, but some of those areas and Denver too, mostly thousand dollar stipends, and most of them those areas either had five hundred or some of them went from a zero dollar stipend to a thousand dollar a month stipend, and that's a pretty significant increase. In addition to over the last year. All state employees have gotten some increase, but we've also increased our starting wages for our maintenance employees by something like seven and a half percent on top of those regular increases. Uh, we're working on building employee housing in Frisco, Basalt, Fairplay, Gibson. Um, the list goes on. I, so, and I don't know if, if, um, Aaron or, or Michael, whoever's running Zoom, is it possible for me to be able to share my screen real quick? Uh, I know there's a PowerPoint up and I don't know if I can. Yes, you should be able to share now, uh, Herman. Can, can you direct me to, I don't know if I've ever shared on Zoom. It's been a, it's been a while. So uh, it's a center in the center. You should have a, a shared screen. Oh yeah. Button at the Big bottom. Screen button. Yep. All right. Um, I have so many screens open. So at, let's see if this works. I have a few of them to share. So are you all seeing a picture right now? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can see so it. that was at seven o'clock this morning. Now we have our snowplow tracker. Not all of our snowplows are on the tracker, but we have our snowplow tracker up on CoTrip. Anybody can go look at it. That's what the situation looked like in the steamboat area uh, at seven o'clock this morning. Um, and then I'm going to, let's see, do this right. Um, uh, midway through stack, um, that was what the snow placard trout tracker showed particularly looking at US 40. I know Northwest Colorado has been awfully concerned and rightfully so. I know it's something that I'm not saying we don't need to work on it more, but, but we are doing, a, I think, a, a pretty good job. And then um, one more to share. Let's see. So when, when Jeff started his budget presentation, that's what it looked like. Again, not all of our trackers are on the snowplow tracker, um, but I think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 plows. So it's not like we don't have folks out there working really hard. This is our third storm of the year. You know, we're still, still trying to do the very, very best we can. Uh, I have a lot of faith in our maintainers and I hope you all do too. Um, I would consider what we're doing a, a pretty good success given the resources that we have and we're going to keep at it. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you all. Okay. So I'm going to keep going with my two questions for you, Jeff. So the first one is what can we do for the short term and with respect to making sure that there's equity in the um, housing stipend program for the future? Um, I think there is a huge cost of left living equity issue within the state. I'm, and I'm not saying that mountain communities are any different than city communities, but we have a, a housing stipend equity situation. And I'd like to know if, if anything's being done. So I, I think I will ask Carmen if he wants to speak to the housing stipend uh, uh, equity issue. Uh, what I will say, Heather, is uh, uh, again, that I think we will be working throughout the budget cycle as we get better information on what some of those things are that we're plan we plan to do and what the costs are for those. And um, we will be bringing forward uh, um, the potentially increases to the MLOS budget if, uh, if we identify um, the, a, a need for an increase um, tied either to uh, uh, additional labor costs that we might see through a cost of living increase uh, or changes to, uh, to our stipend program. So I think um, we, there are limitations, as I noted previously. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have an unending stream of flexible state dollars, but I will say that it, it absolutely is a priority from a budget perspective to make sure that we are uh, doing everything we can to keep up with those costs. So I think Herm, uh, Herman might be a little bit closer to the specifics of 
uh, of the uh, the stipend program itself and uh, and how that's set across the state. So I'll let him speak to that. Yeah, and and first let me say, I'm, Heather, you're asking the the questions and and the things that we would want you to ask because we don't want this to be a this winter only. We need it to to sustain. Would love to be in a position in a couple of years where we are fully fully staffed and we're we're looking at. Uh, looking at a tremendous success, but it's going to take time to get there, not just this winter. One thing I'll say that I think that we've done that I hadn't mentioned before, so I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk about it, is in the past, our housing stipend was based on, and I probably won't get it right, but like the, the Department of Education's housing stipend analysis around the state. Uh, our HR director had a specific study related to CDOT specific needs uh, around the state, and we have we've gotten that result, and in part that's why some of those Denver Steamboat and I seventy areas are getting increases in stipends. We're also making sure we're not reducing any stipends this year. Uh, when we when we let the commission know this was the direction we were going going last month, we made sure we said we we have the budget in maintenance this month. Unfortunately, some of that's vacancy savings <laughs> because we got to get them filled. So we're taking advantage of, of those, uh, those dollars to get us through this year, but we've let them know there's an expectation that that budget's gonna need to go up to accommodate those, those additional costs. Um, we're making sure that no housing stipends are going away or being reduced at all this year. And then once we get through this winter and we have a chance to, to do a more further analysis of the CDOT specific housing study, we'll be implementing some uh, some additional things, uh, and I think you'll probably see some more stipends uh, uh, stipends later. Those are going to cost money, um, but we're confident that the commission supports our key mission, which is getting snow and ice off the roads and keeping people safe. Um, so that will continue to be a focus, and we'll continue to ask you all to, to help us make it a focus. Okay. Um, again, I'm going to ask, where does the money come from? So, Jeff, you're saying that we're gonna do this, but we have to basically rob Peter to pay Paul. So how does the prioritization to continue to have the workforce and do all these maintenance increases, where does that come from and what projects are being quote unquote, like, I guess, skinnied up to ensure that we can continue to have a, a satisfactory okay. winter season? So I, I don't know that I would characterize it as um, at, at this point taking money away from projects or skinning projects up. I think um, we, you know, we have again we have flexible HUTF is essentially the source of money that we're able to use for um, for maintenance. Um, at this point, the we've we've had enough. Uh, we have enough flexible HUTF to to keep up with the costs that we've been building. We're trying to build into the budget this year. Um, so we've been able to get to that $278 million level um, just through essentially growth in HUTF without having to make cuts elsewhere. Um, when we talk about the potential to increase later in the cycle, if we determine we need to make further increases, um, there's a couple of places where that could potentially come from. One is we'll update our revenue forecast. There's the potential we could have a higher forecast of HUTF revenue. The other, and this is kind of where I got back to when I was talking about contingency and potentially making changes to that, we have current a current balance in our maintenance reserve fund and our contingency fund. And so the amount of new revenue we need to allocate to those funds um, uh, is, is somewhat dependent on how much we draw them down in the current fiscal year. So it's possible that we may find that we have enough balance in our, our contingency and reserve that we say, we don't need to allocate as much to the contingency in 24. And some of those dollars could be programmed uh, to, uh, to maintenance. I think, after you exhaust those opportunities, that's where you would probably get in the situation of saying, we have to make some tough choices if we want to do something more. But we're not at that point in this uh, yet uh, in the budget cycle. Okay, and then lastly, how do we uh, stack and then TC convey the message to the legislature that this, you know, I get the short term, but we need to look long term and figure out how we can add li line item add somehow to maintenance to make sure that we aren't in this situation every November 
you know, coming down the pike, even if we're at 100% hiring, then you know our budget's going to go up because of that. So I want to make sure that we have a capacity or a way to <laughs> ensure that the legislature can fix the fact that we are in a maintenance scenario that we're in now that doesn't seem like in the future is going to improve. I mean, we have inflationary measures, we have cost of living increases. How do we say to our legislature, other than me just calling them on the phone, how do we convey that message through CDOT and through our, our means to do this? Herman, do you have, uh, do you have thoughts on that? I might let you take that uh, that uh, question with respect to uh, um, how we advocate. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think just continued support with the Transportation Commission is what's what's most important. And I know they already support. I don't know if if it's I mean, it, um, we're not going to say go to the legislature and ask for additional dollars for maintenance. Um, if we get additional dollars from the legislature, that's terrific, um, and that's for you know, you all to advocate if, if you want. I think we're doing the right things. I'll, I'll mention another thing and it happened a year or so ago. Um, we used to have in our asset management program maintenance along with all of the other assets and those assets competed against each other for the asset management funds. And Director Liu and John both said, well, wait, wait a second, why is maintenance competing with with pavement and bridges and culverts. So we've disconnected the budgeting process in the asset management program. So maintenance is, is dealt with separately because we saw a couple of years ago, there was a actually a reduction in maintenance dollars. And, and when Director Liu and John discovered that, we asked the commission to bump it back up. And it was because some other asset was deemed a higher priority at that time, several years ago, because, you know, these are planning dollars or a couple of years in advance. So we've we've done that. And I think we'll continue to make sure that there's that pretty clear segregation where maintenance is needing to get uh, those dollars and aren't competing for for other projects or other other funds. It's also true, though, that, you know, at some point uh, the budget isn't changing. Uh, we're prioritizing what needs to be prioritized. And right now we have prioritized maintenance uh, and and that's not going to change. So, other comments? Well, one of the things we need to do is we are the State Transportation Advisory Committee, and we're called to advise the Commission on uh, the budget. Is what, are you interested in uh, supporting the draft as it moves forward? Comments? I'm interested in supporting the draft as it moves forward. Okay, we need a motion? great. Yes. I move to uh, support the budget draft. That was presented today. Is there a second? Second. For the discussion. <clears throat> Is there anybody against supporting the draft budget as it moves forward? Hearing none, then I'll consider that motion passed. And I will communicate to the commission that uh, we're supporting the draft as it moves forward. Understanding that as uh, uh, Jeff has said, there's gonna be some more things added or changed as we go along. Okay. Thank you, Vince. Thank you, Stack. Okay. Aaron. Yes, Mr. Chair, I uh, believe next is uh, the uh, Jared Escobar. Um, I think we'll kick us off. Yeah, okay, thanks, so, 
Uh, we have a difficulty there and considering uh, the situation. Um, no, I believe the uh, next presentation should be coming up here soon. No, no, I know that. Oh. But given the situation, are, are we having some difficulties? Uh, no, I think we are clear. Um, and I think um, it will just be uh, a, um, a regular action item for the stack to consider a new member for the uh, for the FLAP um, grant um, project uh, project selection process. So I think we are all, all uh, straightened out. Um, okay, just, just wanna know. Yep, no problem. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, so the next item is Federal mm -hmm. Lands Access Program Overview and the action item is selecting a new representative from STAC. Okay, Jared. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Jared Escabel. I'm the Director of Project Support for CDOT. And amongst other things, I am a committee member for the programming of the FLAP program. The FLAP is the Federal Lands Access Program, which supports projects in, adjacent to, or gives access to federal lands. And the uh, Programming Oversight Committee is a three-pronged committee where I represent CDOT. Jill Lockin represents FHWA, her and her team do the heavy lifting for the program. And then we had Bentley Henderson from Summit County representing Stack. So we do have to, uh, as you said, identify a new Stack member for that committee, but we also first have Jill on the line and she can give an overview of the program. Jill. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jill Lockin. I am the Federal Lands Access Program Manager at Central Federal Lands. Um, and I'm not seeing a presentation on the screen. Did Can you all see it or did you want me to share my screen or did someone want? I'm seeing a, a black screen. Jared, are you seeing a presentation? No. No. Okay, I'll we're, go ahead and- We're working on it, just a sec. Okay. Okay, I was gonna say, I'm happy to share, but if um, it's coming up, I'll, I'll just wait. All right. So as um, Jared mentioned, um, we're representing the Federal Lands Access Program, also known as FLAP. So you'll hear me refer to that as FLAP. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide. Um, I'll give a quick little overview about Central Federal Lands, um, the agency I work with in case those aren't familiar, uh, FLAP program background, and then the Programming Decisions Committee, the PDC, that we're looking for a new member for today, and then um, we'll have time to address a couple questions. So um, the Federal Lands Highway Division is underneath the USDOT um, within the Federal Highway Administration. I think CDOT is typically probably a little more familiar dealing with our federal aid offices, um, the Colorado Division Office that kind of oversees the um, Fed Aid program. But um, the Office of Federal Lands Highway is a, a separate branch that is actually a little bit more like CDOT, kind of a design uh, and engineering agency within Federal Highway Administration. I'll go to the next slide. So at Central Federal Lands, um, we administer a lot of different projects similar to CDOT, um, different programs and types of funds to facilitate transportation improvements for our federal partners. Uh, we assist federal land agencies in the design and construction, um, really focusing on context sensitive designs and um, environmentally sensitive highway and bridge projects. And there are uh, three federal lands offices, I guess technically four um, county headquarters, but three federal lands offices that perform the work. Um, we, uh, Central Federal Lands covers 14 states from Texas to North Dakota. Um, we also include uh, Hawaii um, in our, our um, area. And we are a cradle to grave agency. So we see projects all the way through the planning phases, um, you know, all engineering services survey, roadway design, hydraulics, geotech, through construction. Um, and we oversee the construction projects as well with Central Federal Lands. 
Um, our roads generally serve recreational travel and tourism, you know, providing access to national parks, national forests, and other FLMAs. Um, overall, we provide funding for about 90,000 um, miles of roadway, um, federally owned and public authority owned roads. And so um, we'll focus a little bit on the FLAT program today. It's one of um, Federal Lands Highway core programs. Uh, the Federal Lands Access Program, I think Jared kind of mentioned, it improves transportation facilities that are owned or maintained by a non-federal agency, but provide access to or are adjacent to um, federal land management um, owned lands or federal lands. Um, this is typically to national parks, forests, uh, wildlife refuge, um, BLM lands, uh, any FLMA. Uh, the FLAT program was first created in 2012. It gets approximately $300 million annually. Um, CFL administers about $110 million of that. Um, and our goals are to improve the transportation facilities that provide access to these national treasures. Um, we do have an emphasis on high use federal rec sites and federal economic generators. And so the, the flat funding is allocated by a formula similar to how the Fed aid programs are. Um, essentially, there's the step one that 80% of the funds go to states with a large portion of the federal lands is viewed on a national scale. So that's kind of like the Pacific Northwest um, in particular has a lot. And so 80% of the funds go to those states with 1.5% or more viewed on a national scale. And then um, the category two, those those states get a smaller amount. Um, within each category, the funds then are further allocated based on this graph you see, I won't go into detail, but um, it's essentially based on the number of acres of federal lands in each state. And Colorado gets a little bit over $16 million each year through the FLAT program. Next slide. And so kind of what we're, we're really looking for today and talking about today is who makes the FLAP decisions. So each state has a programming decisions committee. That's a PDC committee that's made up of a state DOT representative, a local representative, and a federal representative. Um, our responsibilities include developing processes and evaluation criteria that we select projects based on, um, establishing the next call for projects. We determine when we're going to hold that how much money we want to um, allocate towards that call for projects, et cetera. Uh, we review the applications that are submitted, um, shortlist and select the projects that will be included in the program and provide input on the seven-year program of projects. So we make decisions when costs increase or there's changes to the scope, we help provide input on that. So overall, we, we manage the flat program and look at each project's individual needs. And so we are um, looking to replace our local representative. Our, our previous representative was wonderful, but he's, he's since left the agency um, or the county. Um, the, re the local representative uh, needs to be a part of a appropriate political subdivision of the state, so local government. Um, from an organization or entity that is suited to represent the local entities responsible for building, operating, or maintaining publicly accessible transportation facilities that are located, located on <laughs> or adjacent to or provide access to federal lands. Um, so oftentimes that's uh, someone from a county, um, city, you know, local government agency. Um, the local rep should work cooperatively with representatives lo of local public transportation service providers that provide access to or which operate within the federal recreation sites within the state and represent local interests for access to the federal land statewide. I know this language is a little dry. It's taken directly from our guidance, but I, I just wanted to kind of make the, the point clear and not miss anything. Um, the local rep may not be affiliated with or work for the executive branch of the federal or state government. So we do want that to remain um, independent as a local representative. And I think as um, most people want to know is, you know, what's the commitment? How much time does this person need to um, be able to commit to this, this team? 
Uh, we usually meet once or twice a year, uh, depending on the agenda. We might have a one hour to a four hour meeting. Um, they can be in person or virtual, depending where the, the representatives are located. Um, it is a heavier lift during an open call for projects when the PDC is reviewing the submitted applications. It happens every few years. Um, and, you know, then it involves, you know, getting together to review the application materials, make sure we still agree with the um, eligibility criteria or the um, selection criteria, which they don't generally change much, but you know, we want to make sure we're, we're just refreshing that. Um, one of the recent changes that came out of the latest legislation is that there's no longer a match component, for example. Um, it's no longer required to bring a match. So we had to kind of revisit the application materials and make sure we were removing that from consideration when selecting a project. Um, so just during those years, it might be, you know, three meetings that are a little bit longer, but still it's, it's not usually a, a very heavy lift. Um, is there anything that you'd like to add um, to that, Jared, based on your experience being on the PDC? Um, yeah, I've been on the committee for about seven years now, and every couple of years, it is pretty heavily intensive when the call to projects come out. I, I usually give a couple of days worth of work to it during that time, but um, all the other times we usually meet just through Zoom or, um, you know, email and just kind of talk about projects that way. So it's, I, I, don't, I enjoy being a part of it, and we do it in the chat box have Keith Baker, who's been an alternate on the committee, he's offered up his services to step up into the primary role, but I'll leave that up to the chair and Rebecca to facilitate in your stack format. Okay, so um, since it's probably time to do that, uh, again, Keith Baker has been on internet and also is willing to step forward to be a full member then we would probably need an alternate. So any suggestions? Nominations? I would like to serve as an alternate if Keith takes the primary position. Kristen, Kristen, Christian Stevens. OK, is there a second to that? I'll second that. Second. Okay, so um, we need to uh, uh, nominate uh, Keith for the actual representative um, also. Is there a motion for that? I move that. Okay, is there a second? I second that. Okay, so we now have two positions that we've had nominated for. Is there any other nominations? Is there a motion to approve by acclamation? So moved. Second. Is there a second? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, Keith, you've been moved up. And Christian, you've been added as an alternate. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Yeah, okay, great to meet you both. You. Look forward to working with you. Is there anything else to be brought before the stack? I have one thing, um, Vince. Okay. You all love listening to me. Um, uh, can somebody tell me where we are with TAP? And the advisory committee and the funding, uh, what's what's going on with that? I know very little about it, except that the TAP program uh, request for applications was supposed to go out um, like end of September, first part of October, but it's been held up for some reason. Now, that's yeah, that's why I'm asking the question. Somebody help us? Yeah, I, I can take that. Uh, other and then Rebecca. Uh, sorry, y'all. I'm suffering from a cold or I go off camera. Um, we are uh, um, taking a very brief pause on tap um, to take a, another look at the program. Um, and now uh, I don't 
we should be able to get it back um, out again and request for applications here soon. We're just trying to sort of dance around the holidays and not have uh, folks asked to, to take applications or to submit applications over the holiday period. So probably looking at early January, getting out the call, but um, we had to uh, take a look at that program again and make sure that our everyone on our team was familiar with it. It's it's been so uh, such a um, yeah, process that everyone just got used to. We haven't taken a step back and looked at it and see how it could best align with the the overall objectives of the department and the different funding streams we have now that uh, we've never had before. So you should see something out here pretty soon. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, random thoughts? Okay, our next stack meeting is December 1st. And that's also a Zoom meeting. Um, at the moment, I don't have anything else. Is there anything else? you want to bring before the stack? Okay, then I'll consider this stack meeting adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Good discussions today. Thank Talk you. Talk to you later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. The recording has stopped.